I V M. Happy Republic Day! It has been 69 years since India became a republic, with a constitution that spelled out a social contract between the Indian state and its citizens. But what does it mean to be a republic? How is this different from a democracy? And in this republic, how is the Indian Parliament faring? M R Madhavan of P R S Legislative Research shares his thoughts on this special episode of the Pragati Podcast. Welcome to the Pragati Podcast, a weekly talk show on public policy, economics, and international relations. I'm your host, Pavan Shina. M R Madhavan is co-founder and president of P R S Legislative Research, one of India's most fascinating think tanks. PRS keeps a close watch on the functioning of the parliament and provides support to all Indian parliamentarians and legislators via research and explainers on upcoming legislations. They also provide them with legislative assistance via fellowships. We'll be back with Madhavan after this short break. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please make sure that you do. We're IVM Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So we did this last week, and we had a pretty good response, and we'd like to keep it going. So if you are listening to an IVM Podcast, take a screenshot of that, put it on your Instagram story, and tag us with it. And what we'll do is we'll repost it on our story so that people get a look at what you're listening to, and uh, people who come onto our stories will get an idea of what kind of things people are listening to. Leave us a comment too. Just don't tag us. Last week we launched two new shows. We launched our first Marathi podcast. is called Golgappa hosted by a regular on our network Trupti Khamkar. Actress Shivani Tangsale is the first guest of the show and she talks about baking, her Everest climbing experience and her love for theater. And we also launched the Filter Coffee podcast hosted by Karthik Nagarajan. On the first episode Karthik talks to film editor Nishant Radhakrishnan about focus group screenings, OTT platforms and the future of the Indian film industry. On the seen and the unseen in part 1 of a two part conversation Amit Verma talks to historian and author Ramchandra Guha about Mahatma Gandhi's early years and his life in South Africa. On the Hindi podcast Cinemaya writer director Tanuja Chandra joins Swati Bakshi to discuss how she started her career with TV and the joys of making thrillers. On Pesa Vesa we have a one hour exclusive episode with Morgan Housel. He's a partner at the Collaborative Fund and a former columnist on Wall Street. He does a deep dive into the psychology of money. That's a really great episode. And with that let's continue on with your shows. Hi Madhavan it's a pleasure to finally have you on the Pragati podcast it's we've been running for a year and a half and um you're an old friend but I'm glad we are finally able to do this on Republic Day on the week of the Republic Day in 2019 thanks for having me Madhavan because it's Republic Day I want to distinguish it from Independence Day Independence Day we are very happy that you know we kicked the british out we got independence but to me the republic in the republic day is a lot more than the march that happens the fanfare that happens in delhi and some of our state capitals as well so can you tell us a little bit about how should we be thinking about the republic and then i want to really spend some time talking to you about maybe one of the most important institutions in the republic the parliament thanks so the way i think about it is that as you said independence is when we didn't have a foreign ruler ruling over us that's about it right it's an important part but then the question comes how if we are going to rule ourselves what are the ground rules under which we are going to rule ourselves and that's where the republic comes in we decided we'll be a republic what does that mean i mean different people have different interpretations one of the things that i learned in civics textbook which i think is a stupid definition is that it means the head of state is not is an elected person so what that's that's not relevant to me it is more like there are certain rules of the game and everybody has to abide by those rules of the game and there are checks and balances and to some extent and we have followed that is uh in our constitution and very strangely given our previous history and culture we have actually put the individual at the center of the republic so the fundamental rights is all about there are some group rights but largely they are about individual rights and we are saying that each individual has a sovereign right over himself or herself which can be breached in very limited circumstances especially only when the right when they exercise those rights it harms others i mean there's a broad principle that you can't harm someone else but otherwise 
the individual at the center. And and this to me is so important, right? Because democracy, uh, I mean, we we talk about how every single national elections that happens in India is the largest exercise of democracy India has ever seen. Right? I mean, because our population is the biggest. China is not going democratic anytime in the near future, and so we see that happening all the time. And I think that's wonderful that we've had free and fair elections by and large uh, since independence. But it is this republic that guarantees our fundamental rights, right? Because if you're talking about pure democracy in the sense that there is some sort of majority rule, right? I mean, that's what whenever we, I think of democracy, it is some, uh, some system of decision making. And that system of decision making is that you decide that 51% of representatives of the actual people will decide what goes through, yeah. or who gets elected, yeah. or something, right? First past the post, proportional, something. But putting the individual at the center, having this grand bargain between what, I mean, I give up the right to kill someone, in return, the state protects me from other people coming to kill me, right? Yeah. At least that's the notional hmm. uh, bargain that we strike. And this is what people forget, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, embedded in that, as you said, if you say democracy is, okay, what a majority of people want, and you can have majority 51, you can have two thirds, whatever. Yeah, whatever but number. What this does is it protects even a minority of one. So there are minority rights embedded in this. And I'm not just talking, when I'm saying minority, I'm not just saying minority group rights. I'm saying that, for example, I am a minority of one in this country of 1.3 billion odd people. My rights, even if Every one of the remaining 1.3 billion people is against me on something. My rights are still protected. And in fact, the constitution gives me the right to directly go to the Supreme Court if one of my fundamental rights is breached. So that's the protection it does. Beyond that, the constitution also sets, creates various institutions. So, I mean, it has parliament, it has a cabinet, it has the president, it has the courts, a bunch of institutions. But it has created a fairly intricate net of checks and balances across these institutions so that no institution can become too powerful and therefore take away any of these rights. So th that checks is cancelled. And I think this is important because if I actually, when someone pointed this out and I had a very quick glance through, so I'm not an expert, a very brilliantly written constitution which belong which was written for the Weimar Republic. It <laughs> it assures individual rights, it assures freedom to practice your religion, it assures that every German citizen is equal in the eyes of the law, and a bunch of these things. And we know what happened to that in the 1930s, right? So one of the I would say a huge achievement of our country, and I'll say it's an achievement of all of us across, I mean, the political establishment, the individual citizens, the civil services, everyone, is that we are unique in one particular manner. As far as I know, of all the countries that got decolonized from mid-40s to maybe early 1960s, we are the only sizable one. And... Let me define sizable as anybody more than 50 lakh population. I mean, we are way, way higher than that. So I'm ignoring some tiny countries like Jamaica. Okay. <laughs> uh, we are the only one which has never had army rule. Okay. We have not, we have actually gained, if you think of the India map, other than the issues with Kashmir where we had the Pakistan and the China incursions and all those issues. But the rest of India, we have actually gained territory. The French territories, Pondicherry and all joined us. Goa joined us. Sikkim was the last part. So for a large country, extremely diverse on any axis that you can think of. Language, race, religion, I mean, food. You think of anything, we are possibly the, one of the most diverse countries. To decide that it makes sense for us to stay together and to stay together and have the overall governance structure that has enabled us to discuss between ourselves how to 
negotiate our differing interests and manage that. That I think is a massive, massive achievement which we should not underplay. I mean, we we tend to generally look at the negative things of the negative side of things, but this is a massive achievement. I I think I remember reading about how in the 1950s or so, I mean, Yugoslavia had all this uh, pride about how. I remember reading uh, opinions and views from the 1950s where they thought, you know, India is this weird, not really a nation now under one state, uh, which which is going to dissolve in no time. And some of these were coming f- even from the likes of Yugoslavia and so on. Who were like, you know, Yugoslavia is a strong um, a republic and it will stay strong and so on. And today, the Balkans... Uh, have become a verb. The Balkans have led themselves to calling it Balkanization and India has sort of survived in, by and large, in a unified form, right? And uh, so do you, so in this, so one is the Republic, one is the Constitution. Uh, There's another thing, I think a couple of my colleagues had worked on this. In, even within Asia and, and our region, constitutions are a dime a dozen, right? Uh, Thailand, I think, uh, is now on constitution number 18 or 19 and they keep changing one every few years. Uh, Most, so many other countries have rewritten their constitutions many times. And India, while it has the system of amendments and so on, it's been the same sort of living entity. Um, as, and as pr- perhaps even what Ambedkar put it, it has to be a living document because it can be the perfect document and if people discard it like they did in the Weimar Republic, then you will have uh, Nazis at your doorstep. Yeah. And it's not just, I mean, Korea has, South Korea has had six constitutions to my knowledge. Okay. And even the Western world and the French are on their fifth republic. Uh, the latest one is after de Gaulle. So the current French constitution is later than the current Indian constitution. And if you look at Europe, Spain and Portugal got rid of their dictators in the 70s. So their current constitution is much younger than ours. So And go to Latin America, same story, Argentina, Brazil, the large countries, I mean, across the world. Okay, uh, It's in fact, other than uh, Western Europe and the America, US and uh, Canada and maybe Australia, New Zealand sort of thing, the really developed world. Uh, very few have had this sort of stable rule. I mean, the so what is the constitution? It is essentially the underlying structure for all laws are what governs us. For everyone else that has actually had significant changes, we have also made changes as you said, more than 100 of them. But they are made through a mechanism mentioned in the very same document. Okay. And since 1973, the Supreme Court Keshan and the Bharati judgment, even that has been limited to how much parliament can change the basic structure of the constitution. And which was this wonderful invention, right? It didn't exist. I want, can you spend yeah. a minute or two on that? This, to me, this idea that this constitution has something called a basic structure, which I do believe in, mm-hmm. but it's basically, it was legal innovation of a sort, right? Saying that there is this something fundamental if you, even as two-thirds majority, 99% majority, if whatever present generation decides under the current system, we will still block it uh, as a judiciary because it violates the spirit of something fundamental to the constitution. So this uh, this is clearly a legal invention. Uh, I mean, apparently the the Germans have it in their constitution. There's a concept of the Germans. We borrowed it from the Germans. Okay. The current German constitution, but still, it was a nice innovation by the judiciary. I have sort of mixed thoughts over it. If you're a purist, you would say the constitution did not have any of this. It allowed any amendment as long as two thirds of each house and in certain cases, 50% of states allowed it. And in fact, many of the speeches of Ambedkar also said that constitution has to change with the times, etc. Okay. And not just him, many of the others. So that was a thought. But... Imagine a situation where, let us say there is someone, and we have had that in the 70s, who has clearly two-thirds majority in both houses and controls more than 50% of states. And let's say, like Hugo Chavez did, amends the constitution to say that the current prime minister will be the prime minister for the next 25 years. Or become, you can amend the constitution. What happens? Okay. It's in a way a constitutional coup. So, 
I mean, democracies like the US took a long time to stabilize. They had a civil war, remember? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we haven't had one. Okay. Uh, so, for us, in the, we are obviously a much younger democracy. We are a much poorer country. We have been, I mean, our literacy rates are way lower than many of those. We are politically aware, but still, I mean, which shows in elections, but still, uh, there are lots of shortcomings. In this situation, this is yet another check on the power that the executive through the parliament, because by definition in India, whoever is at least fifth, majority support in Lok Sabha is the person who forms the executive the government. It's yet another check on how much change, radical change that they can do. So they're allowed to bring about change, but the amount of change they can do gets limited by this concept of basic structure. And I think that's actually very important and it's nice to have that innovation. And it's a very, now, I mean, while we might have borrowed it from the Germans, it's a very Indian trade-off. Right? Of course. To, to of course, and, and beautifully, it's not exactly defined about what exactly the basic structure is. So, it's a case-by-case case decision, of course, based on precedent of earlier decisions. We'll be back with Madhavan after this short break. India's a massive subcontinent, home to truly stunning diversity. Behind the veils of smoke that obscure our thriving cities, our history is still alive, glimmering like sequins, waiting to be discovered. And if you, like me, are straining to hear the echoes of our past, this podcast is for you. I'm Anirudh Kanisetti, a history and geopolitics researcher, and I host Echoes of India, a history podcast about India, by Indians and for Indians. In Echoes, we journey through the complex histories of South Asia and what they can teach us about our globalized world. Tune in every Wednesday on ivmpodcast.com or your favorite podcast app. Welcome back. This brings me now, we are talking about the basic structure and the nature of this constitution itself as a check and a balance on power and the distribution of power. So, can we now talk about the parliament and how you think the parliament serves as a check? I mean, we broadly, again, going back to thinking from the lens of democracy, every five years, uh, we come to elections, whoever is governing makes their case, there are a bunch of opposition politicians who make their case, and the Indian people and the electorate decide who they want to elect. And we elect our local representatives and hopefully they form a party or something. By the way, I don't think a party is defined in the Indian constitution. Uh, not in the original constitution. It gets actually defined in the uh, Representative of People's Act, 50 and 51. That's where it comes in. But in 1985, when we added the 10th schedule to the constitution, which, which we call the anti-defection law, it's actually a constitutional mechanism, the political party makes its entrance into the constitution there. Okay, so we'll talk about that. But before we get there, um, so we largely think about voting someone in, voting someone out. And even here, this we often think of this parliamentary exercises, yeah, notionally representing my area, my constituency in the national parliament. Yeah. But by and large, we think about it as a distributed vote to decide who becomes prime minister and who, which party and which coalition becomes government. Hmm. But is there more to the parliament than that? Because that is still yeah. the executive and how the executive gets formed. Yeah, there's actually much, much more. And I'll, so I'm coming back to the idea of the checks and balances. Okay. And if you think of it, whoever has the executive has power. I mean, the person controls the police, the person controls the army. So in a way, it's only the executive arm of the government which has control over the violent part of the state okay the which controls guns hmm. okay and the union government controls the armed forces and, uh, and yeah, the home and, and the paramilitary and paramilitary so on. and the state governments control the state police so the governments control whoever holds arms in the country okay so they have exclusive right over violence right and therefore you need very strong mechanisms to block any use of this these arms which is not desirable okay so so so, so, how, so does how does parliament do, do? 
So there are multiple checks and balances. Okay. So I'll just come to the parliament in a second. I'll just cover that. So there is parliament which does this. There are courts which actually stop certain sort of things. Then, of course, there are other checks like for elections. There's an independent election commission in the constitution. Uh, along with the parliament, it's a joint mechanism. You have the C and AG, uh, which checks how the government is using its financial resources and works through the parliament in a way, reports to parliament and therefore comes back. So there are multiple ways of checks. Okay. Now, parliament is so i let me just do courts and then parliament because i'll say why parliament is very very important so when do courts come in courts will come in when there is a breach of law okay so when there is already a law existing and somebody breaks the law then the court comes in or if there is a new law that is enacted again by parliament which violates the constitution then the courts come in and as we discussed if there's a constitutional amendment which violates the basic structure, the courts come in. So courts are limited to stopping certain types of violations. Okay. Now, there may be actions which are legal but not desirable. Okay. Who keeps a check on that? That's where parliament comes in. So parliament, in a sense, is a daily accountability mechanism over the government. Okay. So very different from, let's say, the American system which is a presidential form, where the executive has certain powers and unless the executive breaks the law, you can't do anything for the next four years. The president is the president for the next four years unless you can impeach him on a proven case of breaking the law or certain things. So you can't replace because you have no longer faith in that person's ability to function as a president. Okay. Whereas the parliamentary system, there are multiple checks. Okay. Starting with the fact that on a daily basis, the question are, ministers are asked specific questions to which they have to respond. Then there are multiple other motions and debates in which people can ask questions, raise questions to which the government has to respond. And of course, there is what you could call the nuclear option of the, the confidence vote, where the moment the prime minister and the cabinet of ministers loses the confidence of a majority of members of parliament. They have to leave their job and somebody else comes in or there are elections or something else happens. So you don't have to necessarily wait five years. Five years is the outer limit for elections to be held. They could be earlier. So there is a very strong checks. Okay. Now, in addition to what we see on TV, there are also checks happening off camera which is what happens in parliamentary committees. So often committees summon secretaries and various other civil servants who have to explain what they have done, why they have taken certain actions. And the committees come out with recommendations which the government usually has to comply with. I mean, there's no rule that they have to, but there is always an action taken report to these Recommendations where the government has to justify why it hasn't followed certain recommendations. So at least there is questioning and the government has to respond. So that again puts in a check on what the government does. And coming to the committees and what I said about the CAG, same thing happens. What happens to the CAG reports which we read about, okay, which newspapers highlight, okay, CAG exposed so much, so much scam, blah, blah, blah. From what the happens? notional laws of uh, 2G. Yeah, 2G, whatever. To There's a, there are a bunch of things. To far more cogent, far more important, cogent. There are lots pedestrian of things sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, quotidian things. Uh, Correct. And what happens to those? Those reports are tabled in parliament. Parliament has a committee called the PSE, Public Accounts Committee. That committee takes up these reports. And it looks into these issues. It asks questions of the ministry. It will, the CAG also will testify. They'll explain why they have come out. And then they come out with the set of recommendations. So sometimes it need not be just to hold somebody to account. It can even be constructive. For example, it can come out like that these checks, check mechanisms CAG points out are not working. So it might come out with a newer mechanism by which that is a greater accountability system built in for the future. So it can even be constructive suggestions of doing things in a certain way ahead. Rather than just finger pointing. Rather, rather than, than just finger pointing. So it can be very constructive. And we have seen that in several reports. And similarly, do you... Uh, so where does the parliament come in 
it has a huge role with money right so yeah. to me uh, even before we get to money and budgets we read these cag reports because they are tabled in parliament mm. right because they are tabled in parliament they become public documents that you and yes. i can access now thankfully we can access online yeah. uh, even otherwise we can access on the prs website <laughs> even if the government websites are not working right so this to me all comes via the parliament rather than the executive choosing to make these documents public correct because like in any institution everybody nobody wants to make themselves transparent so you need to be forced to do it it is true for companies it's true for anyone right so company side requires companies to put up their annual report and file it in the roc which anybody for a minor fee can access otherwise companies won't do it so it's for anybody okay so parliament is the body which holds the executive reach and therefore imposes transparency on the mechanism so what does parliament do i'll just quickly talk. broadly speaking i would say uh, three different things i talked a lot about the holding the government to account of course they are called legislators because they make law that's an important part so every law that is made in india is made either by parliament or by a state government if it's a state list or a concurrent list subject by by state uh, assembly so it is has to be made by the legislature okay. and, and the third, third part third very important city councils part. are also supposed to make city laws but no, we we'll leave no, that they actually don't make law they make regulations it is it's sort of a delegated legislation from the state hmm. okay which is which is a separate problem which is a separate issue okay uh so the third big role is essentially what's called the power of the purse so in fact if you look back at the history of parliaments starting from it all began in england in some time in the 13th 14th century when power was wrested from the monarch okay so the, one of the first things that was wrested was the power to tax so the monarch can't arbitrarily tax and spend and in those days monarchs used to tax and spend on usually on w- war campaigns or on building their own palaces so that there was check put it and how was it done it was said that any new tax can be imposed only by an, a law passed by parliament all government expenditure needs to have prior approval of parliament and of course that has seeped in across the world onto all legislatures including in presidential systems like the us like you can see the us going on lockdown because expenditure has not been sanctioned by the congress etc so in india we have obviously followed the westminster model the british model for these things so you cannot spend any amount unless parliament has sanctioned it which is what we do through the budget process etc and all taxes again are passed by parliament and when i say parliament i also analogous mean state assemblies when it comes to states i mean they're similar one big thing here comes in is and this again we have learned from the british and inherited that system yes the question of what happens if the rajya sabha blocks expenditure what could happen so the the government will stop functioning so if, the government, a... if the government can't spend money can't pay salaries government shuts down and if you have a different if you have rajya sabha blocking it then there is some sort of log jam which has happened and the system is broken down and Because that will resemble the american system a little more a little a bit more so the british figured this out and we have sort of taken that which is that since the only set of people who can decide who f- is the prime minister in the cabinet is are the members of the lok sabha therefore they should have the exclusive power to decide what spending can be done what taxes can be imposed you can't give it to somebody else because then the government falls so corollary of this is that therefore therefore what we have it is that all money bills which means spending of the government new taxes and broadly say Uh, and only those things and nothing beyond that is the exclusive power of lok sabha so they have to be introduced in lok sabha if lok sabha passes them it goes to rajya sabha technical term used rajya sabha doesn't pass it returns okay so rajya sabha can make changes but they are recommendatory in nature lok sabha has full freedom to reject those changes okay uh, now corollary of that is that if a money bill fails lok sabha 
the government it's equal to a no confidence motion and the government goes so there is no shutdown there is just the government being the government gone. the prime minister is expected to resign and then you will have someone else on new elections or whatever so madhavan as you mentioned the parliament is this important in its functioning in the check that it keeps sort of daily on the government uh, and not just you know, once every five years we vote someone in and vote someone out which is only one form of accountability and one form of uh, uh, incentives how all do you see this constrained on a daily basis weekly yearly um in the way you see it how is the parliament hamstrung in how it keeps a check yeah. and uh, do we have a system where the legislate we you know we talk about judiciary overreach a little bit in the country right the yeah. judiciary does more than what it was supposed yeah. to do the judiciary says in a judgment do river linking yeah. right um, which, which is a bizarre thing for a judiciary to do so one where does the leg- legislative function stop and is there anything called legislative overreach oh actually legislative overreach directly is not there for not one sim- for one simple reason they do once in a while but then the court checks them and strikes down the law okay okay so oh, so, so you make a bad law which you, you make a law which violates the constitution that is overreach okay and that is checked whereas a court overreach there is no check there is no check on a court and that's important not to have a check on a court also because they need to have their independence so that's a very is what you would call a wicked problem i mean how do you solve it is not an easy one so the legislative okay. over the reach issue is far more simple and it, it's just simpler because the courts can check so then okay. how is the legislature currently checked okay and checked in a bad way okay so i would say i would split the role of the legislator in two sort of two dif- he wears two different hats he wears the hat of a representative not just of the constituency but somebody who is elected by the people of the constituency i would actually take the burks idea of a legislator which is that the person is supposed to discuss with his colleagues and find what is best in national interest okay of course national interest is a very fluid idea but what that person believes is good for public interest which could vary with ideology etc but what that person believes to actually vote his conscience by the way the weimar republic had a line which says that each legislator shall vote his conscience and shall not be bound by any instructions okay <laughs> it, it was there in the weimar constitution and our constitution unfortunately i mean i would actually think that we should have adopted that lofty ideal it didn't work for various other reasons but the ideal is lofty we have completely undermined the idea of parliamentary democracy by a 1985 action which is the 10th schedule which is the anti defection law where the legislator is wearing the party hat and not wearing the conscience hat and now of course everybody wears both hats usually in most countries but we have said that when it comes to a vote in parliament not to ask questions not to raise issues in the committee but when it comes to any vote where the person counts as uh, when you're seeing majority or whatever counting numbers the person is bound by what the party instructs him or her to do so what the anti defection law says is if the party issues a whip on any vote then the legislator has to abide by that whip so if the party says vote yes you have to say yes no no if the party says abstain you have to abstain and if you don't do that if the party says yes and you either do a no or an abstain you can lose your seat in parliament you are essentially there will be by elections then you are out of parliament so what do other countries do i mean the concept of party giving instructions is not uncommon because you are a member of the party so you are a member of a club the club has certain rules if you break the rules the club can expel you from the club so the party can take disciplinary action but the club can't expel you from your society which is what is happening here it's expelling you from the larger body which we incorporated and incidentally just to this thing one interesting aspect here is this great rule law where you get expelled if you don't follow the party whip we share with five other great democracies okay all of them followed us they are pakistan bangladesh guyana sierra leone and zimbabwe no one else has <laughs> it no one else has it 
Okay. So the one question to me is, do you want to be part of this exclusive club or not? If we claim to be the world's, let alone claiming being the world's largest democracy, to be to claim to be a republican democracy. So the parties have that much power. Yeah. And do the parties ever not exercise a whip now? Rarely. So most parties, there are some exceptions. Okay. Especially when the, if there is a party which has more than one significant leader. So there are parties with internal multiple leadership where people are still jostling. Okay. Nobody is like fully in command and there may be rival positions taken. In which case they do allow, for instance, rare case, when the women's reservation bill came up, there were two factions within the JDU then, one which favored yes, one which said no. So the party said, okay, let people do what they want. We won't issue a whip because the party did not have the internal uh, power. The leadership didn't have the internal power. But that's a very rare incident. In general, on every bill, it might be a very, very inconsequential bill in a political sense. For example, it could be a public sector undertaking, which has been set up by a law of parliament, where there's an amend because it has been set up by a law of parliament. Uh, if you want to make any change to its governance, you need an amendment. So it might be saying that, okay, you need one extra technical member in the board of directors. Oh, fine. I mean, who would be against that? But even there, Every party will issue a whip because it has just gotten, now it's become a habit. You just issue a whip and everybody abides by that whip. And you're in the opposition, so you just say no. Yeah. A lot of the time. Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. In fact, that's not correct. Okay. Okay. Because we did, okay. okay. I haven't done it this Lok Sabha, but last Lok Sabha, we went and looked at when the UPA2 and UPA1, I've seen both, uh, the BJP, which is the principal opposition party, I think more than 85% of the state, because, we, okay, I'll come to that. We don't really know how they voted because there's no recorded voting. I am assuming that if a person from that party stands up in the speech and says, I support the bill. And since there is a whip on, then the, I'm assuming the party is supporting the bill. Okay. And if I go under that assumption, my if my memory serves me right, definitely more than 85%, close to 90% of all bills were supported by the opposition. And I think that is continues to this date in this parliament. I haven't done, I haven't done a detailed analysis, but roughly speaking, I would not be surprised if it's that. And there are reasons for that, which is that no government wants to lose a bill in the house. So they have already done back channel negotiations. They have figured out what will get the opposition to say yes. They have made those changes before they actually bring it to the final vote. So final vote is by and large a large, large majority, almost near unanimous. And and especially in our system, because now you can't persuade individuals within yes. the party to change one way or the other. Yes, you just need to get to the party leaderships. And again, uh, there is a big difference in the structure of this parliament to the last. I'm not saying any particular party. It, it's actually more structural, which is that when you have a coalition government, then you need to at least convince the leaders of the other coalition partners. When you have a majority by one party, which happens to be now, it could be some other party. It has been in the past. I mean, this was done, remember, this was done in 1985 when it was the Congress in power. Okay. So when it's a majority of any party, then the party leader doesn't even have to convince anyone else. Okay. I can get the whip issued, especially given that most parties in India, with a few exceptions, have very little intra-party democracy. So is this related, Madhavan, to why we've seen an explosion of political parties since uh, the 80s too? Or did that explosion start even a little before that? I don't know. It started earlier. I won't attribute to anti-defection. No? Okay. I would say it could be more due to intra-party democracy because if you are a local leader and you you know there is a glass ceiling, Okay, would you be a big fish in a small pond or will you be a small fish in a... I mean, slightly smaller fish in a big pond. What do you want? I mean, you probably can exercise more power. And of course, this helps because now, if you can be the sort of supremo of a smaller party, which has still, let's say, 10, 15, 20 members of parliament rather than 150 or 200 members of parliament, you could still, because you control the 15 or 20 votes completely, you can possibly command a larger power 
and we have seen this happen uh, especially with the tamil parties over the at least the previous few which has happened where in any coalition where i mean where where no party has a majority the largest party is sub 200 or close to 200 and needs a bunch of people this will happen and you can see that even in states now it's sort of the swing having the yeah the the power in this. the swing has the power and you if you control the swing then you have power so so this is on one big structural impediment to how the parliament can function effectively where our parliamentarians and people we elect vote with their conscience and think with their conscience hmm. and make that heard in on the floor of the assembly of the parliament what are the structural changes do you see i mean we uh, talked about the power of the purse and the money bill being decided by the lok sabha yeah and that can also get violated right because sort of a speaker decides true that so, something's a money bill and we've mm-hmm. had uh, the aadha judgment sort of drag on mm-hmm. in the courts before mm-hmm. finally only a minority said that look this was a money bill and therefore not legit the majority mm-hmm. judgment was that we we'll let it be in its core it yeah, was a money bill so yeah majority said in its core it's a money, money bill so the aadha was not struck down for being passed as a money bill so here yes so the here what is the check that is getting bypassed so the constitution says each house of parliament has to pass every bill by a majority of the members present at the house if a bill is a money bill then rajya sabha has effectively no say now it also says and if you read article 110 carefully that it's a money bill if it has only and this is a very important word only issues related to a b c d e f g which is essentially taxation and government spending so you can't tag in five other things and bypass rajya sabha that's the idea it also says the speaker decides and the speaker's decision is final other judgment was very important in one way it actually said when the speaker's decision is final it is not really final the courts, the courts, can, still look- courts can still review the decision to see whether it was it followed the constitutional requirement okay so that's an important precedent they have said so even though it it might have been a messy judgment what it implies it, it to the added future one check. it added one check as a uh, so since it has since as a constitutional bench which has said that that is now how the constitution has to be interpreted and that that adds respect to the so, ch- so the next the time the speaker decides to do it, something it can be challenged in court okay now what has the uk done i mean something useful to learn from they have said that it should not be the speaker with the exclusive power speaker still has a power but the speaker shall consult two senior members and typically that includes the leader of the opposition or somebody nominated by that so it's slightly larger consensus before marking it as a money bill which puts some check in the system because if there's a dissent note it obviously creates its own issues so they have done that of course the uk has done many other things to make the speaker more nonpartisan than we have which is that they have built in a custom that the speaker usually leaves the party the speaker and how does one ensure i mean the speak by definition if a speaker is a member of the party the next election for the speaker to continue as a member the party has to give the ticket so the party does control some things over the speaker so there they have built a convention that usually that the all the major parties will not put up a candidate in the cons- in the speaker's constituency against the speaker okay there are 650 mps let one go and that provides a far greater level of independence to the speaker to act his or her conscience because the and speaker knows bothered. that they will go back to parliament they will come back to parliament so the party's hold over the speaker is much lower hmm. okay so they have built those things okay of course there's a different story that the uk has had a history of 700 years of parliament or 600 years of parliament we have had 70 so so i mean we i'm sure that we will build in this one more important thing other than the money bill which i touched upon when we talked about the anti defection rather when you asked me about uh, do uh, people vote does the opposition vote against the government the real thing is that we really don't know we don't so for example i live in new delhi my constituency is new delhi i don't know how my representative voted on each issue i don't even know whether she attended or voted in parliament on that issue why 
because most of her votes are voice votes. So the speaker says, those in favor say aye, those who say no. And if the speaker believes, hearing the voices, that there's a larger number of people shouting yes, then no, the speaker says, I have it. And that's about it. Unless some member demands what's technically called a division, which basically means that you have that recorded voting in which every member's vote is recorded and reported in the proceedings. So in the proceedings, I can see that. The last uh, two or three Lok Sabhas which you have tracked, less than 10% of bills, so more than have been passed with the recorded voting. So more than 90% of bills have been voice vote. So I have no clue what happened. And in a sense, one just to highlight this, one important bill where there was recorded voting on three amendments passed, so we have the data, was the criminal laws amendment which was passed in 2013 after the Nirbhaya incident. It was a fairly important amendment amending the laws relating to rape, stalking and a bunch of things. Because there somebody demanded division on a couple of things and therefore in the proceedings we know who voted how. Almost everybody voted for it. But I also know that 198 people in Lok Sabha voted. Which means less than 200 of the 540 odd people were actually present in the house when that happened. I know that. I know who they are. Now, it would be useful to have that every way because, see, again, one of the good things that one notices about the United States, yes, and all of us watch that nice TV drama, which is called the uh, presidential debate before every presidential election in the US, which is good fun to watch. Questions asked often, I mean, didn't happen with this president because he had never held office before, but questions asked, let's say, Obama versus McCain type, both are senators, is why did you vote on such and such an issue in such and such a way? Why did Hillary support the, the war, war in Iraq? Yeah, yeah. It was asked. We can't ask because we don't know because there's no record of how they voted. There's I mean, nobody knows. I mean, it's not. It's just not captured because it's a voice vote. So it will be very important to bring that in, and it's actually an easy measure, which you don't need any change in rules. You don't need change in, change in laws. All you need is one member of parliament who wants to make this reform and is willing to take on the establishment and at every bill he just stands up and says i want a division okay maybe more practical let us say 10 or 15 of them form a caucus and, and ideally cross party and say and this is an improvement we need and, and we'll ask if you demand the speaker has to give and this is not anti-defection this is not anti-defection they will speak because with... still they, you'll have to vote according to what the party has said but you still because if you after recorded, if you vote against the party, then you lose your seat. So you will vote, but still you know what they did. And then we can ask them, at least why were you present there or not? Why were you not there when this important issue came up? It's important to me. So here's to hoping that maybe in the 2019 Lok Sabha, if not in some of our state assemblies, we finally have this conversation starting if maybe at least one member of parliament, if not 10, stand up and just asking for division in after every bill. Yeah. So, uh, I am quite optimistic overall. Okay. So, these are some of, I would say, glitches for me. The anti-defection is a serious structural issue which we brought upon ourselves uh, 35 years after the working of the constitution. So, we seriously need to review that. But interestingly, there are voices coming up. I have seen a few op-eds here and there now. More people are actually talking about it. Uh, there are even members of parliament who have written against it in op-eds and articles. So people are thinking about it. But overall, the system by and large works. Okay, We are broadly confident that if a law is passed by parliament, it has the support of the majority of members in some way. We are broadly confident that with all the glitches in the electoral system, the person who has got the maximum number of votes in that constituency is by and large the person who is elected as a representative. We are very confident that if there, if any prime minister or government loses power, in a, loses the majority in the next election, they will hand over power to someone else. In fact, we have always held elections on time, exception being 1976, when we didn't do, we pushed it to 77. But when Mrs. Gandhi lost the election in 77, she didn't call in the troops. She handed over power to the Janata Party government. So, this sort of worry, which is there in many developing countries, newer democracies, whether 
I mean, if Mugabe loses, what happens? Will he hand over? Will he get? And all those questions. Doesn't even enter our thoughts, right? I mean, would you think in, you are from Bangalore, if there is in the next election, whenever it happens, or if there is a no confidence motion and the current chief minister loses, will he hand over power? Does that even thought even enter your head? No. You know that he would. Yeah, our so, concern will be what hot okay. will happen in the next election, what yeah. corruption, what... what that, that's a lower level concern than the fact that Absolutely. people would by and large abide with the larger constitutional scheme and subvert it at a lower level in various ways, which happens everywhere. I mean, the power of money in elections is... I don't know there is any democracy which doesn't have it. That's part of it. We need to figure out how to manage that and control that. That's important, but that will be there. So, I would actually say that as a republic, we have done, I won't say a good job, I will actually say, say an amazing, great job. Most of us, I mean, I would say, have multiple identities. You think of yourself as you belong to a state, a language, but you also, most of us think we are Indians. I mean, when you came from Bangalore to Delhi, I don't think you ever thought you were going somewhere else. I mean, you're, you're just walking in within your country. You're in India at, at some level. I think creating that idea that we are a nation, we are a country, building that in is something no one else has done. I mean, look at Europe. I mean, we are like, we are as diverse as Europe. But I mean, across the European countries versus across states of India, and in many things, including size, including population, I mean, most of our states, um, larger states are larger than any European country. I mean, even Maharashtra is way larger than UK or France. But we don't bucket ourselves so much into boundaries. I mean, we do have tensions, which is natural. But we resolve our tensions through constitutional mechanisms, through conversations, through negotiations. I mean, we did the linguistic division because it was needed. We managed that tension and it seems to have worked well in hindsight. So we have done a bunch of these things. So in the long run, we are not doing too badly. I would say we are doing absolutely amazingly. All right. On that note, um, uh, thank you so much, Madhavan, for coming on the Pragati podcast. We hope to have you again on the show, hopefully before the elections, before to talk about a variety of other things as well. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you for staying with us till the end. Please share this episode with others and please help spread the word about podcasts in India. If you listen to the Pragati podcast on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, please leave us a rating and a review. It will mean a lot to us. Visit thinkpragati.com for your daily dose of brain fodder. Subscribe to the Pragati podcast on the IBM Podcasts app or wherever you get your podcasts from. We are there every day. Did you know that Parsis in Mumbai, instead of being left at the Tower of Silence after they die, are now cremated? And why? Because a cow fell sick in the early 1990s. Did you know that the smog in Delhi is caused by something that farmers in Punjab do and that there's no way to stop them? Did you know that there wasn't one gas tragedy in Bhopal, but three? One of them was seen, but two were unseen. Did you know that many well-intentioned government policies hurt the people they're supposed to help? Why was demonetization a bad idea? How should GST have been implemented? Why are all our politicians so corrupt when not all of them are bad people? I'm Amit Varma and in my weekly podcast, The Seen and the Unseen, I take a shot at answering all these questions and many more. I aim to go beyond the scene and show you the unseen effects of public policy and private action. I speak to experts on economics, political philosophy, cognitive neuroscience and constitutional law so that the insights can blow not only my mind but also yours. The Seen and the Unseen releases every Monday. So do check out the archives and follow the show at seenunseen.in. You can also subscribe to The Seen and the Unseen on whatever podcast app you happen to prefer. Advertising is dead. Yep, you heard me right. Advertising is dead. We're all in the content business now. 
let's not call it news tv radio etc etc it's all content and we're in the middle of this weirdly exciting phase where all the borders and lines that have been drawn over decades has been swept away by this lovely thing called the internet we're a show where we don't dwell on just the stuff that is now but rather the wider stuff about advertising media content and the whole goddamn circus surrounding it tune in every tuesday for our weekly unboxing of the mystery box we used to call advertising i'm varun dugirala co-founder and content chief at the glitch and this is my new podcast advertising is dead <laughs>